After World War II ended in 1945, America's top enemy for 50 years was an economic system that seemed unstoppable. Communism, the extreme form of socialism. Its chief champion, Russia, head of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. One country of nine million square miles. That's our own country three times over. Or all of North America and a million square miles to boot. The USSR threatened to export its system worldwide and had nuclear weapons to back up the threat. The U.S. risked Russian attack in the name of freedom, democracy instead of dictatorship, the economic freedom of a free market filled with choices instead of a command economy where government does the choosing. The idea of socialism or communism, though, can be quite appealing. An economy based on sharing, collective effort for the common good. In the 1930s, this economic system actually seemed an alternative to the risky free market capitalism of Europe and the U.S., then suffering a Great Depression with unemployment of 25 percent. By contrast, Russian workers were said to be fully employed, happy, equal. Why even orchestras said the propaganda films had no conductor, no boss. There is no leader. You'll notice that the eye of the musician is always on his music. But the image was a charade. Since bureaucrats, not the market, set prices and production quotas, supply and demand never met. Since everyone got paid the same, there was scant incentive to make good products. Command non-market economies eventually collapsed in Russia and elsewhere. And yet, a few countries still swear by socialism. Among the most extreme, Cuba, just 90 miles from Florida. No longer supported by Russia, Cuba is now struggling with the tensions between free market capitalism and government-controlled socialism. For the economic tourist, Cuba, and especially its main city, Havana, is a surprise. Yes, there are plenty of the expected third world vignettes, the make-work jobs, the makeshift travel arrangements, a public transportation system bursting at the seams. When the Soviet Union collapsed and its subsidies vanished, people were nearly starving here. But in recent years, a major makeover has been in progress. Cuba decided to sell its culture, its climate, its beaches to foreigners. And so tourists poured in all over the country from all over the world. Hotels now abound, especially in Havana, and new ones are going up, built by everyone from the Spanish to the Chinese. The U.S. forbids doing business with Cuba, but Cuban joint ventures with the Japanese and Koreans have brought in household gear you might see at any American shopping mall. And supermarkets offer an almost all-Cuban clientele everything from Brazilian Diet Jello to Jack Daniels and Johnny Walker Red. This year's sales at the Supermercado up to this moment, they are $6,324,000. The average bill per customer is $17.36. That's right. Here you pay not in Cuban pesos, but in U.S. dollars, encouraged after the Russians pulled out. Tourism and foreign investment help dollars now reach, it's estimated, more than half the Cuban population. In short, it seems like capitalism is taking root. On the other hand, many Cubans still think capitalists are pigs, business is dirty, and that all production should be sold to and through the state, as these real pigs will be as soon as they fatten up. The state gives me everything I need, the grain, the breeding stock, so my commitment is to them. Sometimes the private guys show up, but I don't trust their scale. With the state, I always have confidence. The government still issues every family a monthly ration book for enough food to survive. Dictator Fidel Castro has banned billboard advertising in favor of political propaganda, featuring revolutionary martyr Che Guevara and slogans like, this is the socialist revolution right under the nose of the U.S. And when we tried to interview a would-be emigrant, the police stopped us, took our documents, and wanted to take us downtown. We sneaked these shots from our van. 
The government did let us interview prominent dissidents, at least those who weren't in jail, like Elizardo Sanchez. But they said Cuba's as unfree as ever. In Cuba, existe un modelo totalitario de tipo. What we have here is closer to the Soviet totalitarian system, an absolute state monopoly that controls virtually everything, down to the barbershops. In Cuba, then, an economics reporter can feel totally confused. At some moments, you think Castro has saved the command economy, and right under Uncle Sam's nose. At other times, it seems clear the free market is burrowing irresistibly from within. The elite Lenin High School, we figured, might be one place to sort things out, since this is Cuba's training ground for the next generation. A group of English speakers was waiting for us. Hi, schoolmates, I tell you, you're welcome, and I hope you get satisfied with our school, with our students, with us. Thank you. Oh, thank you. We got the red carpet treatment, and it kept getting redder. We don't want capitalism. We have, uh, we want socialism. We are the same people. We, we have the same clothes, the same scenes. It's not that the other country, that you're better than me because you had a new Adidas and I don't. The kids at Lenin High seem determined to sustain socialist equality, even if it means no Adidas. As for the market changes Cuba's made. We don't want those changes. We have to uh, put them there, there, there because we need them. When we don't, if we don't need them anymore, we will fade it. Fade it. They will fade it. That is, phase out the free market experiment that Cuba has had to conduct. Now, maybe these market changes are temporary, and schools like this will restore Cuba's purest past. Or maybe, instead, Cuba's many private markets are already beyond a point where anyone can fade them. Food production has exploded, for instance, because of free market incentives that let farmers sell privately some of what they produce. So, incentives work? Clearly, yes, it's obvious. That's the way it works everywhere. Incentives not only mean more food, more available, without long waiting lines, they also mean better food at the private markets. It's better quality. This is what people are looking for. There's less fat, there's less bone. You understand? You even see socialism versus capitalism at the old ball game. Omar Linares is a slugging superstar who's had million dollar offers from U.S. teams, but turned them all down. Why? I prefer to stay in Cuba because this is my country. Everything I have accomplished, I owe to the revolution. On the field, the socialist party line. In the stands, however, entrepreneurship run rampant. He, Omar Linares, well, uh, donde? Quanto? Five dollars. Five dollars. Omar Linares? No. It doesn't say Linares. It says a different name. It's the way he signs. He does it real fast. He, he signs with another name? No. I don't know. Maybe he was in a hurry. The question is, can social equality hold out as the market marches in? A question so much in the air, it's the punchline of Cuba's top joke, judging by how often we heard it, the Hotel Nacional gag. A girl dumps her boyfriend, the joke goes, because he pretended to be a hotshot at Havana's ritziest tourist hotel. He swore he was the doorman at the Nacional, the girlfriend fumes. In fact, you know what he does? He's just another damn Cuban neurosurgeon. In other words, there are Cubans paid by the state Cubans paid by the market, and less and less do their wages meet. It was no joke to economist and Cuban exile Antonio Morales Pita. For me to become a professor, I had to study 20 years. I have to work very hard. I have to sacrifice part of my youth, part of my marriage, in order to, to be become qualified. And then this other person has finished eighth grade or ninth grade in, in grade school. How is it possible that he's going to make 10 times more than I make? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. Because you're undervaluing it. You are undervaluing it. And eventually, there are not going to be very many bright people becoming of professors. Of course not. Of course not. No, of course not. In Cuba, the struggle between market freedom and non-market rules grinds on. You see it in sugar mills in the countryside parking lots in the city, the streets of downtown Havana. The question is, 
can socialism hold out here in the face of a global market economy?